said, the first third of it is... Uh, but you've, you've, you've got to set this party on a course that will end the world and somehow make them not suspicious. And it does suggest that you spread these out somewhat so that they're not immediately suspicious that they're the ones who caused this. So it's like, um, you know, once you turn it over, it suggests actually running them through an entirely different adventure before you go on with this. This is very... This book is very deceptive in that it, it's trying to keep you in the clear. You know, I didn't, I didn't plan this. This was, a, you know, it's trying to make it so you weren't setting them up. You know, the whole thing is trying to make these players not suspicious that they're playing the Apocalypse Stone. So what happens then, where it gets cool, is that naturally the Apocalypse, they've just kicked off the Apocalypse. But it's one of those apocalypses that starts off really slow and has really strange portents. So immediately upon taking the stone, like I said, they have they've ripped the drain plug out of the universe. They have severed the connection between the prime material plane, which is Earth, and the other the other planes of dimensions and things like that. So the instant they took it off the island, they've they've cut that cord. The significance of that is that nobody can uh, do anything that contacts, travels to, or through any outer plane. Astral, ethereal, inner, elemental, whatever. Um, if there's any spell they have that leads to an extra-dimensional space that they create, like a uh, rope trick, bag of holdings no longer work, anything that creates some kind of extra-dimensional place, it doesn't work. Teleports... Um, teleport without error no longer works. Normal teleport, because I think it has to be somewhere pretty close. That still works. But you cannot, from this point forward, escape. So you can't just go, oh, shit, world's falling apart. Hey, guys, let's go to Sigil. Can't do it. So this is where they've they've committed you, is... No matter how powerful they are, no matter what you think you can do, you're not leaving. You can't. And neither can anything else. So just in case you're trying to hitch a ride with somebody else, or you've got some magic trick, or something like that, it will not work. That connection is gone. Worse, um, clerics and paladins, whatever they are, um, are probably the hardest hit by the removal of it, because the gods live on the outer planes, and the outer planes are kind of drifting away. And the further away they get, the more powers they lose. So, uh, it says, like, it says, you know, choose an arbitrary measure of time, but let's say a week. Every week, they lose uh, the highest level spells they can cast. All right. So, you know, after a week, if, you're, if your cleric can cast, you no know, eighth level magic, after a week, he can only cast seventh. Like, the gods just do not grant him spells, which I think is actually a really cool way of making the group kind of panic, you know, um, especially kicking the uh, cleric's ass and to try to figure out what the hell is going on. So, um, also, the, the other side effect is that uh, essentially it makes the... It, it, progressively makes it a lot harder for the players to go into fights like this, considering their first aid station is drying up. So if they're somehow able to blast through encounters, the cleric is going to have a much harder time trying to do that. The other effect is that un this is another really cool effect that I liked a lot, very biblical. Um, the undead get their power. They're actually, the undead in D&D are, they actually have like a power source. Something animates them, to put it another way. Like Frankenstein. When you make a Frankenstein, it, you get hit with a bolt of lightning, and the bolt of lightning is kind of like the Promethean flame. So a Frankenstein get up, gets up. He's been, he's been animated with some essence of life. The undead are like that as well. They get their energy from the negative energy plane. So essentially, death. You know, negative energy is the opposite to positive energy, obviously. So they get almost like powered by the vacuum of energy. Evil. They get powered by evil. Actually, it's not even evil. It's negative energy. Whatever. So, um, that connection to the negative energy plane has been snapped, meaning a lot of undead creatures lose a lot of their abilities. They can't drain energy. They can't drain levels. Um, 
no regeneration, and no more undead may be reanimated. So no more undead will come up, but at the same time, ghosts and other ethereal undead, um, the dead have nowhere to go. So if anyone dies, eventually, rather soon, rather, their kind of their specters will rise because they cannot leave to the, you know, uh, ethereal or astral plane, wherever they're going. So you still have like ghosts starting to rise from the grave, kind of upset. So while no new undead can be reanimated, there's a plenty of ghosts coming up wondering why they're not going into their eternal reward. So, and then it actually goes on about the various, essentially like revelations start happening. Um, to basically freak your uh, freak your players out. So, of course, there's the Plague of Insects, uh, the Reign of Frogs, uh, Disease and Pestilence, uh, uh, a Lack of Faith because the clerics are losing their magic. People think the gods have abandoned them. They have. Um, sickness, a swarm of vermin, uh, Great Wars, uh, you know, the... As, as things start to fall apart, armies are taking this opportunity to uh, to seize the opportunity to invade each other, essentially. So the Great Wars, uh, the Birdemic, uh, changing the weather, rivers and seas boiling, earthquakes, volcanoes, darkness covers the land, dogs and cats living together, mass hysteria. So the second third of this very strange. I like it, but it's very strange. It, it, okay, so another bit of history is that uh, hell, okay, devils don't like each other. They certainly don't like people on earth, you know, they don't like humans, they don't like elves, but they hate each other too. So hell is kind of this um, uh, political morass of you know, backstabbing, infighting, that will eventually, that oftentimes boils over into just full-scale conflict. So you have all these demon princes who each run a level of hell, all trying to basically take over. One of these is Moloch. And Moloch is a, a, former, uh, a former prince of hell who actually rivaled Asmodeus, the, the big bad of hell in power, but he was betrayed and cast out. And now Moloch trying to muster up his forces to make a reinvasion of hell and fuck up the, the other princes who screwed him up. Well, he's been here for a long time, mustering all his, uh, his forces, all his devils and trying to, trying to get them all together so he can make one final push. His, the bad thing that happened was he sent all his guys through to kind of stage, get things staged and get ready. And he's, you know, he's psyching himself up. And then your guys pulled the stone out. And now with the connection snapped, he can't get back to hell. Which means without his leadership, his army just got, his army just got squashed. So he has now realized, he's looked into this. He's realized he can't get back to hell. His entire plans are screwed. Plans he set, you know, with, you know, untold years in motion, they're all gone. It's, it's their fault. So he, his reasoning is he knows that they're all going to die and there's no getting out. And I, I guess he assumes that if, you know, if might as well have some fun in the meantime and get his revenge and kill them before they all die. So the second act of this is Moloch's also very, very elaborate, uh, scheme of revenge to not only kill the players, but destroy them psychologically because he wants them to know who it was who had beaten them. Uh, so it gets messed up from here. I actually really like the, the writing here because it actually takes this demon prince of hell, Moloch, and it writes him as if he has a serious hate on for you. Like, what would a demon prince do if he fucking... Not, if, not just he had a case for revenge on you, if you fucked his life, if you fucked up the Satan's life, and you gave him a, you gave him a month to plan, oh, 
oh, it'd be good. And that's what this hit. That's what this is. Now, again, the flavor text on this, the stuff the DM reads to the players, is too obvious. You cannot read what they wrote, wrote here. But if you get the setup, if you're any good, you can make this work. So, and actually, I, I get the feeling that when the writers handed this in, uh, uh, Jason Carl and Chris Pramus, I'm guessing when they handed this in, whatever editor they had looked at this and was like, oh, no, 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 you, no, you got to change this. And I can see where, trust me, I know where they changed it. Okay, so what happens is Moloch has figured out where the players are going. And he has, uh, he, they're going towards some kind of just they're an inn somewhere. Wherever they're going, there's an inn on the road. So in preparation for them, he has gone there or sent his minions there, his absurdly powerful minions, butchered everyone in the uh, butchered everyone in the tavern and set his own little uh greeting up now it's not just them getting jumped by demons or uh, devils rather they don't just get jumped no when they go in everything is normal and there's a very kindly storekeeper uh the innkeeper and uh the you know, patrons all over the place and you know they welcome them and offers them a room. It's called the Eight Fairies Inn. He says, he's like, oh, well, there's plenty of room. There's a table by the fire. You know, uh, what can I get you? And it's, and the way, again, way, the way this is written, it's way too obvious something's up. So if you're a DM, you have to just play this like it's any other tavern. You know, so you play this, if I'm doing it, it's, yeah, well, the, oh, the guy waves you and he greets you and the, uh, there's a very, there's a very comforting fire over there and there's someone, there's a, there's a minstrel over there playing quietly on a lute, and everyone seems very, you know, interested in what he's saying. And the the uh, bartender, you know, he's wiping his hands, and he says, ah, so what can I get you? Uh, well, we have fresh ale on tap. Um, also, our stew is delicious, and uh, my wife's, uh, you know, our pork stew is delicious, as are my wife's specialty um, uh, uh, piping hot pork buns. We also have uh, a delightful house mead. You know, just start reading down the menu. But the key is he's supposed to be pushing like the the pork buns. At least this one says push the pork buns. But you've got to like bury that. Be like, oh, there's all the delicious stew. There's my oh my wife's uh, special pork buns. We're having a special on those if you want. You know, um, so stew you get to be, or or just don't even mention it. It says like oh well he hands you a plate of uh, bread and he brings you your stew and he says oh, you should try these. These are fantastic. And they you know they taste them and they're great. Here's what he did. Moloch. He killed everyone in there, and everyone in here is either an illusion or also uh, another devil. But what he also did was he took the kindly storekeeper, the innkeeper, I'm sorry, he took all the other patrons who he murdered and the uh, innkeeper, and he ground them up into meat. And he put them in the stew, and he put them in the pork buns, and he's going to make them eat. The people. So, Soylent buns are made of people. Now, the way this book is written is, uh, uh, yeah, it's all illusion except for the meaty buns. Um, it says something about it. They make it very clear that they should not eat the pork buns, that they sense something is wrong before they bite into them. But somehow that doesn't tip them off that they should leave or anything like that. So this is, I know editorial came in here and did this. So where, where, where do we get the, uh, um, he's proud of the pork buns he whipped up. Um, yeah, I'm oh, sorry. Um, crap. Well, it says that they, they, uh, smell something wrong with it. Ah, here it is. Um, just before biting into one though, the diner suddenly finds the pastry unappetizing catching a strange odor or feeling a sudden chill. Have your player make a roll if you wish, but however, however you choose to handle the situation, the PC should not actually consume the meat for a very good reason. That's where editorial came in. I know it. I know they were like, you can't have the players commit cannibalism. That's fucked up. 
you know, and Jason and Chris were like, <laughs> yeah, are you serious? And they're like, you can't have them eat people. And so, yeah, I'm guessing they put that in there. They're like, you definitely should not have them actually eat it. Maybe like swish it around in their mouths a little bit. Oh shit, what have I done? You know, but if they sense something is wrong or that it smells foul or a chill washes over them, way to blow that one. So apparently it just assumes that if they actually try to eat, but realize something that they'll just go to their rooms anyway. If a chill washed over me handling a baked goods, I would be somewhat suspicious. So the, uh, the next morning, you know, they go upstairs to their room. Nothing happens to them that night. Um, but when they wake up, the uh, the minion named Scalathrax, he dispels, actually, in the morning, he dispels all the illusions. One of the illusions is that uh, the beds they're, they've been sleeping on are uh, beds of razors and spikes. Um, I believe the illusion can make it so that it's safe to lay on until the illusion is dispelled, at least the illusion in question here. So when they awake, they are now laying on just jagged razor blades, which causes an insane amount of damage and a great way to wake up. But they're awake now. I can think of no better way. So <clears throat> right away, they know something's up and that they now have like eight inch deep razor blades all over their body. Um, 2d20 damage. Uh Per round from the metal blade. Why would you stay on there for more than one? Getting off the blades would be also fun. Ugh. So when they go downstairs, upset, I imagine, uh, another nightmare scene awaits them. Downstairs, the entire common room, which seemed so cozy last night, has been turned into an abattoir that's been painted in blood, soaked in gore. Uh, it's a completely disgusting scene. Basically, the entire inn has been painted with the victims. Except for the uh, table in the center of the room, which is impeccably set uh, for breakfast. Chairs, nice little, little dining sets laid out. And in the center, there is a platter filled with the same pork buns they had for dinner last night with a note signed M. It says, so it begins. You have only to wonder when you'll meet your end and who will be your executioner. While you ponder, please enjoy a complimentary breakfast. Eat up. The staff put a little bit of themselves in each bun. I shall left me as you left her. I shall leave me. I just blew that one. The, there's people in the buns and you ate them. Ha! I had something there and I lost. Fuck it. I was caught in the movie and just, you ate people. M. Um, so, the, this has something less of an impact if the the devil thinks that they ate people and they didn't actually. So I'm pretty sure the way this was originally written, they were supposed to eat, they were supposed to eat people's buns. That uh, didn't happen. So mainly because it's supposed to be like really horrific. And I'm not saying what I'm saying is it should be really horrific. If that's the, they should have eaten people. <laughs> um, that's not, honestly, if you know me, that's something that I totally would do. Not eat people, but write an adventure where they eat people. I might eat people. No, I wouldn't. Um, but yeah, you've seen my Thieves World campaign, you saw how messed up I got with that. I'd be like, dude, eating people is the least of what they uh, what this guy would do. And it is the least of what this guy does. So as it goes... Wait... Oh, it says in a little, it says in a little teeny box, it says, uh, if you want to go like extreme horror, um, yeah, this is a lot like the, uh, you know, the play Titus Andronicus or the Greek story of, uh, Thysites. Is it this? Oh, they don't say Thysites. I was right. Um, so it does get, well, if you want to, you can have a, you shouldn't do it. I'm like, yeah, you should. So afterwards it gives stats for these two the the two mega demons sorry devils there's a difference it gives stats for the two mega devils who set all this up even though they're not going to be in this encounter just in case they're pissed off enough and somehow manage to track them which i think is a nice touch these things are just 
also godlike. You know, they're they're basically arch devils. Um, and the next thing, which I think is even for my games fucked up, is the second part of his revenge, where he's trying to psychologically break them, is that as they're just wandering through the woods or wandering down a path, they reach a clearing, and you know maybe they've maybe they've just beaten the the other devils and they're feeling really proud of themselves. Then they reach a clearing where there's a number of other creatures standing in front of them. And it says, uh, you know, they, they, you're facing a group of hunk, hulk, hunking, hulking monstrosities equal in number to your own. Each, uh, each top seven feet in height and looks like the creation of a lunatic with mismatched extremities and disfigured features. Crude stitches crisscross their bodies. All right. So they've encountered flesh golems, which for a party of their level and power, flesh golems are nothing to them. But they are stitched together bodies of all of the uh, of all of the party members' families and best friends and anyone they hold dear. Moloch has somehow like like scryed or used magic to divine like all their most personal friends, families, and loved ones, killed them, and created flesh golems out of their sewn-up pieces. And it's got a picture. Like, ew! So, the next... He throws these monsters at them that are just these gigantic Frankensteins from their stitched-together parents and wife or whatever. And so... Either, I can't remember if they should, uh, the golems attack and they have little choice but to defend themselves. They're not a serious threat to high-level PCs. Yeah. So, um, they can't talk, but they still make moaning, shrieking sounds that are almost like begging that are recognizable nonetheless as their friends and family. <laughs> and I'm like, oh God. Yeah. And that this is where they're like, in, in, in this is messed up. So then it gets worse. Well, it, it gets worse in a sense. So it says, uh, obviously the player should be somewhat traumatized by this and angry, but first more than likely any group that's role playing worth a crap is probably going to want to bury them, you know, after they've chopped them back into pieces. So, um, it says, this is where Moloch is finally going to make his move while they're burying their dead friends and family. So after that, you know, he appears in his full roaring spectacle of, you know, hatred and rage and sulfur and fiery wings and shit. And he finally just, he declares that, you know, this is, I'm the one who's been doing this. It's me, Austin. And this is why. So, yeah, he says, you stand on the brink of annihilation and you don't even know why, do you? Ha! Pathetic mortals. Your thoughtless action has not only ruined my triumphant return to hell, but also destroyed the mound of dirt you call a world. This miserable backwater might tear itself apart, but not before Grand Duke Moloch exacts every ounce of his vengeance! I don't like... I like this guy. So, actually, this evil speech is meant to be the first real implication that the reason the world is ending is because of some shit they did. So, um, that's assuming they live, which is unlikely. Because at this point, they are now facing an archdevil. Uh, like a literal uh, archdevil. Who, I remind you, is basically, at was at one time, uh, a physical, you know, like a, a, a rival for Asmodeus, who is a god. So at this point, they are now fighting a god. Essentially. Um, now, it's true the, the devils in question are uh, much less powerful now because one of the devil's main powers uh, are, is the ability to gate in lesser devils. A gate being they open basically a dimensional door and devils flood out. Those no longer work. Anyway, so assuming they survive that, and by the way, this guy has uh, three pit fiends which are essentially Balrogs. But they're, they are worse than Balrogs. They're pit feet... No, Jesus Christ. They they are lords of the pit. That's... Yeah. So, assuming they can get through that in one encounter, one, uh, uh, 
Moloch, the 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 uh, Grand Duke Archdevil in Exile, his three pit fiends, and his what do you even call him? A Nikoloth and a I'm sorry, they're both Greater Yugoloths. Which again, if you have to ask, they're tougher than you. If they lived, and these guys did. This is where they started to die, however. They start to realize that uh, that they probably did a dumb thing, but they don't know why. At this point, I believe um, an avatar of the God of Justice appears and just tells them flat out they fucked up and that they need to go get the stone and bring it back to the, to the island. So they're like, okay, might as well. But now the world is officially getting screwed beyond all belief. Um... This is where the writing gets crap again, because for some reason, for some reason, the God of Justice is trying to test them for their worthiness. What what worthiness? What do you need? Really, he's testing them morally, and he's testing them, like, through skill of arms. I'm like, dude, do you have any idea? You must have, you do have an idea of the shit... They had to hack, pardon me, they had to hack through to get the freaking stone. We just beat Moloch. We cut a freaking archdemon to pieces. He's like, oh, I'm a, I, I've got to test them. i got to make sure. What if they fail? Well, then you're, fu well, test them. Just send them out there. So this whole thing is there's like a bunch of tests of their morality. Who gives a shit? Who gives a shit if they're moral? I, I would think they don't want the world to blow up. That's where they keep all their stuff. But no, we gotta we gotta test them to see if they. There's also like th literally one of the tests is their ability to prioritize. Okay, so th the test is that there's some kind of uh, like a knight who appears in front of them and he. Uh, he tells them, he, he asks them, have you seen it? And they're like, seen what? And he says, well, the horned beast, the, you know, the horned beast has been devouring entire villages. It's, you know, we need to stop it. You know, there's, there's tons of innocent people dying and it's, it's heading right towards my, you know, my, my father's lands and things. He's trying to, he's trying to recruit them to go kill this giant beast that is devouring entire villages. And if they go, they have failed the test. Why? Because they're supposed to they are supposed to prioritize the saving of the world over the, the needs of the many. But okay, first off, this test makes no sense for a number of reasons. I just said that. But for instance, if there is a paladin or anyone lawful good among them. They should not refuse this guy. Even if the world is going to blow up. Like, okay, a paladin cannot refuse. According to their code of chivalry, they can never turn down anyone who genuinely asks for help. As in, they ask for help and they genuinely need it. And they, you know, the, such a thing will serve the cause of good. So this guy is asking them for help. The paladin will be like, okay. He goes up. And then he's failed the test, apparently. Now, I guess you could say that's a test of his ethics and the fact that his ethics are fucked, but I'm like, okay. Then they proceed to tell you what happens beyond there, because that you actually will find the horned beast. The guy wasn't bullshitting you, but this... Okay, so what's the horned beast? I've been leading up to this. This is where Crazy Mike's party got wiped out. I don't know how. They, they fucking slaughtered everything over here. And I've heard people who who blew through this monster as well. Again, I don't know how. The Horned Beast is a Tarrasque. <clears throat> Sorry, it's a Tarrasque. The fuck is a Tarrasque? You are more than likely asking. The old timers among you, actually, no, the Tarrasque is in other versions, are going, uh. Okay, the Tarrasque. <clears throat> it's Godzilla. No. Well, it's Godzilla, but it looks like Zilla, the American Godzilla. And I mean, actually, the picture in this book is actually pretty crap. 
but it's really it's it's supposed to be it's this is that's the Tarask. Sorry, nah, this. It's looks like more of a werewolf in this one, but trust me, it's Zilla. Um, this the Tarask is essentially a world ender. It is the it is sin. To borrow a Final Fantasy X term, here's a better picture of it. It's a little more like Zilla, and there's people running away, and they're like, ah. Now, it doesn't look like much... Actually, this does not do its scale justice. It's way huger than that. Um, it is very bad. It's mean. Because um, looking at this picture, like, well, how's that worse than a freaking ancient dragon? Well, here we go. You're going to love this if you've never heard of a Tarask before. Uh, it has 70 hit dice. It says 300 hit points on the outside, and you're like, well, that's not a lot. Just wait. It is an armor class of negative three, but that's going to be an interesting story as well. It has a Thacko of minus five. Thacko is an acronym for to hit AC zero. You don't need to know what that means. Just suffice to say that minus five is impossible and excellent. As in, if your AC is zero, it needs a, it needs to roll a negative five or higher on a d20 to hit you. It's hitting you. It will hit you. How many attacks does it have? Ho, oh, six. That would be claw, claw. It attacks with all four of its claws. So arm, arm, leg, leg, uh, tail, and bite. So it does one to 12, one to 12. 2 to 24 tail, 1 to 10, 1 to 10, other two claws, and 5 to 50 with its bite, which it cannot miss. Um, it's, uh, there's only one, as in there's only one in the world, but that's enough. And here's the other fun part. Uh, it's, it's a killing machine, and when active, eats everything for miles around, including animals and vegetation. Um, yep. Sweeping tail lash, four claws, a bite. Um, and the bite acts as a sword of sharpness, meaning if it, uh, yeah, it severs a limb on a hit of 18 or better. So if it bites you, it bites off whatever limb it gets a hold of. Um, oh, I'm sorry. No, it, it's, I'm sorry. Uh, two claws, and it's two horns. It has big horns. Sorry. Um... Let's see. Uh, creatures of three levels of hit dice or less flee in panic. Um, if you have seven or more levels, you have to make a save versus paralyzation or or run. So anyone who sees it pretty much has to run. Um, it's carapace. is it, it has a turtle shell on its back, I think. A turtle-ish shell. So it's like Gamera. No. Um, it's exceptionally tough. Uh, bolts and rays such as lightning bolts, cones of cold, and even magic missiles, the toughest of all, they're useless against it. In fact, it reflects them back on a 1 in 6. There's a 1 in 6 chance that it will bounce directly back at the caster and hit them normally, while the rest bounce off harmlessly to the sides and in the air. It is immune to heat and fire. It regenerates hit points. Um, only enchanted weapons can hit it. It is totally immune to all psionics. Um, gets better. And let's see, where does it say that how you kill it? Um, where does it say how to kill it? Ah, um, slaying of the Trask is impossible. It is possible, but it's not. It is said to be possible only if the monster is reduced to minus 30 hit points and then a wish is used to wish it dead. So not only do you have to chop it to death, and you have to keep chopping it to death, you have to chop it beyond death to minus 30, and then hope one of you has a wish spell to wish it dead. Okay. And even then, I might be dickish enough to say that, well, the book says... It is said to be possible only if you do this. I might easily just have it be like, oh, you wish it dead? Well, then, you know, later on, 
you know, they, they may have just assumed it was dead and later on, what, cut it fucking back? What the fuck? You know, I'm like, what? it was just a legend. They were wrong. So, yeah, um, you cannot just keep, uh, you can't just burn it to cinders. Uh, even the smallest bit, even the smallest atom of this thing will eventually regenerate, actually eventually, rather quickly, regenerate into the full-grown Tarasque. So you cannot miss a single thing. Uh, and that's impossible considering I'm guessing it bleeds. So you have to wish it dead. Um, it says there's all sorts of treasure inside it. Good luck killing it, though. Um... You know, the origin of it is, uh, it's some hidden abomination, it's, yeah, it's some hideous abomination unleashed by dark arts or by the elder forgotten gods to punish all of nature. Nobody knows. Doesn't matter. It's Godzilla. Um, now the funniest bit is there's a note at the bottom. And I'll try to show you this if it focuses, but you're yeah, probably not going to see it. It's on the, it, it's right down here on the bottom. It says, note. Creatures with a minus Thacko can only be hit on a one. Creatures with a minus Thacko can only be hit on a one. Sorry, I slurred. Can only be hit on a one. Okay. This makes no sense. Because, as I said, Thacko is to hit AC zero. Its Thacko is minus five, which again is, is excellent. In fact, a negative Thacko is almost impossible. In this case, though, it's basically Godzilla, so it's hitting you. But it says creatures with a minus Thacko can only be hit on a one. Okay. Thacko has nothing to do with its armor class. With how its ability to hit something has nothing to do with its ability with its potential to be hit. So, and besides, it has a thing called armor class. So by definition, nothing. So a Thacko, minus Thacko, but it can only be hit on a one. This has been the topic of much debate. Whether or not this is a typo or not. It seems obvious that this is a typo. Um, the most obvious assumption would be that uh, creatures with a minus Thacko can only miss on a one. So... Basically, the rule is when you're rolling to hit, if you roll the dice and you roll the 20, well, you hit. That's just it's it's basically a house rule. But it's I think, yeah, it's in the it's in the D&D &D book where, uh, you know, if you roll a 20, you hit. It's a 20. It's a crit. Um, if you roll a one, no matter what you miss. It's a one. You know, it's the lowest number. So one would assume that even though it's it's. To hit AC zero is so absurdly good, it's, he gets a bonus, you know, even though it's negative, he should still have the ability to miss. So on a one, he still misses. That's the assumption that this is just a really, really horribly typoed line, right? Um, I, I believe uh, somebody wrote in to Dragon Magazine um, which is this Dragon Magazine, another episode here, by the way. Um, there's a column, there was a column in Dragon Magazine called Sage Advice, written by a guy named Skip Williams, who is essentially the the sage, the you know, the the authority, the rare the rules clarification expert. So every month in Dragon Magazine, fans and uh readers would write in their D D questions. For rules clarifications, many of them just really fucking silly. But one of them, th by the way, this is before the internet, really, where you could just like, kind of look online and see if there was like rules errata. There was errata, but you wrote Dragon Magazine just for, not even for errors, just for clarifications. In this case, though, the uh, I believe the reader asks, what the hell is this? Creatures of the Minus Thacko can only be hit on a one. They have nothing to do with armor class. And I think, for some reason, Skip was just very evasive about this. He's just like, mm, yeah, the Tarrasque, that one's a weird, that one's an odd duck. Yeah, that's pretty weird, isn't it? And I think, I don't think he really came down with a decision on that one. Um, 
here's why. In a way, it doesn't matter. Because this is game over. It's game over. If you run into that, you're done. You lose. It's the, the nature of this thing. They might as well just call this game over. Um, you can tell this thing is made to be impossible to kill. Minus 30 and you need a wish spell. Only a party that's running the fucking apocalypse stone could possibly be able to kill this thing. So if you're at this point, you need something that'll wipe out, th wipe them out. You know, th this is the reset button on your, uh, on your game. So this is, this probably isn't even the final boss here, but it might as well be now. So in a way, you don't even need to ask what, if this is a typo or not, does it matter? No, because the player should not win this. I mean, this is ridiculous. Um, now, I like the way that it's written. And I'm a stickler for rules. I like this. The fact that it can only be hit on a one, which is an immediate botch, meaning you can't possibly hit. I like that. Meaning, let's, as let's assume this is a... Let's assume that the little speculative backstory or origin of this thing is true. Um, it is hoped that it is a solitary creation, some hideous abomination unleashed by the dark arts or by elder forgotten gods to punish all of nature. Again, Godzilla. You can't kill Godzilla. Even if you kill him, you haven't killed him. I mean, the Japanese defense force used the oxygen destroyer on the motherfucker. It didn't put him down. It, temporary. But... Even that is more than I'd give you here. So why the hell would I have it only be where a one hits this thing? That makes no sense. Okay, here's why. Let's say this thing was literally the the anthropomorphized or you know material manifestation of the elder god's wrath. It's protected. Okay, so if this thing is it's it's basically a, a gozer you know, choosing the form of the Destructor, you lose. Good day, sir. So this thing, I like this rule because you. I would assume this thing is ordained by the gods to be invincible. You can't do it. You can't hurt it. So almost like... Um, no, no, int no intentional force of man could strike this thing. You can't hit it. It's just, it bounces off or you miss or whatever. So I would say like, there's some enchantment or some godlike magic where it is impossible, impossible to intentionally hit this thing. And that's the key, is intentional. The only way you could possibly hit it is to botch. So you could try to swing at it, but you miss so colossally that you, you miss so badly that you hit it by accident. That way it's not up to the, it's not up to your will. It's up to like a, a, a chance. It took damage accidentally, you know, by fate. It's, it's not up to you anymore. It's up to fate to decide whether or not you actually hit this thing. So if somehow fate ordains that you guys botch enough to deal, to deal 300 hit points, 330 hit points of damage, more so because it regenerates. No magic and stuff, you whatever. But that I, that's why I like that, is because it almost represents that uh, you can't kill it unless somehow it almost either kills itself or some botch is so friggin' colossal that... You just do it. I mean, but there's with this thing, there's no just doing it, you know. Um, so it's a silly rule. It probably just means that it 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 is almost certainly a typo, where it says like even though it has a a a faco that makes it impossible to miss, it still misses on a one. I like the typo. I think the typo is great because they shouldn't win. They should not win. 
And uh, sure enough, Crazy Mike's party did not win. Um, I believe they were pretty much uh, their. I believe their asses were pretty well kicked by Moloch. You can't wade through three pit fiends. I don't care how good you are. Well, I guess you can, but these guys didn't. I think they lost a couple people on Moloch, but the Tarask finished them off. Uh, not good. Not good. Especially, like I said, it severs limbs on an 18. And at this point in the game, your clerics are probably at like one third power. So it's not like they can just start slapping limbs back on like in the old days when they were wielding ninth level magics. That's why they start doing this. Now, if somehow they actually beat the Tarask, yeah, they can keep going on. Um, sure enough, there's an entire other level here where they meet a Death Knight. And actually the Death Knight joins them. Because he wants... He, th this Death Knight is... Uh, he wants to redeem himself. Or they could fight him if they want. Like, then again, a paladin would be like, no way, I'm a giant of this motherfucker. Um... There's another moral test. Uh, there's a there's two I don't have to say uh, two behirs, which are essentially dragons. They have to fight. Um, and eventually, they have to go to Moloch's um, his own keep, the Black Keep, and try to get the stone back. This is not going to be easy. Because he has his own group of bad guys, each one of which is a freaking party ender, naturally. Um, there's also his his personal apprentice, who, uh, yeah, not good. And then there's Prince Garloth, whose stats are so abusive it takes an entire page. He is, as you might guess, a 20th level human mage, which actually I think is aiming low. Uh, they probably are not exercising the uh, the d gods and demigods or whatever it is the the player's option book for over twentieth level twentieth seems low for this guy, but um, yeah, even if you beat this guy, yeah, he can power word kill you like five times. But at this point, if they got through the Tarask and they got through Moloch, this guy's nothing. I I'm I'm guessing he's nothing. Um. The only, the only interesting part about this bit is that um, it is clear when they reach here, the world has got like 10 minutes. And so when they interrupt, even Garloth has realized that something bad has gone wrong. Obviously something bad has gone on. So he's been trying to find a way to escape. So he's been trying to use like, he's been trying to use the stone to... He didn't even. He's he's got something in mind where you, when you interrupt him, he's in the middle of some like, you know, obviously like the the big uh, not conflagration, but uh, uh, the grand conjunction. You know, the you know the most powerful magics he could possibly will and summon. He's trying to do this to maybe find some escape to this thing, and nothing is working, and certainly not when your guys kick down the door. So he actually uh, says that. Look, I know what you like. I know, okay, I know. But uh, I'm your only hope of getting out of here if you just let me finish. That's the only interesting thing about this where I'm like, now, clearly, this guy is evil as hell. And he's caused essentially the end of the world. But he is your only shot out of here. Mm -hmm. Because at this point, it's also... Um, well, you can end this any way you want. You could actually have this end with them not dying, in which case you have solved nothing. But maybe you've got a soft spot for these guys. They've they've gone through a lot. Um, although the uh, the way the adventure is written, it's clear that you're not getting out of here, even if you do what he says. But it is a way to get out of here. I mean, it maybe it works. Maybe in your adventure it works. But in this case... Um, it should be pretty clear that no matter what, it's just too late. You know, by the time they you have some gigantic, really awesome looking battle, you know, the sky is ripping apart. Meteors are literally falling all around. You know, this is like the big epic showdown on the slopes of Mount Doom or whatever, you know, whatever, you know. I, I, if I was doing this, I would describe this in the most like epic, 
literally apocalyptic way possible where just like the world chasms are opening up, you know, lava shooting up and you're fighting this dude and all his minions. And it's like, it's, it's all futile, but you're going down in glory, I guess. I think that's a really cool image, but no matter what, by the end of this, even if they get this guy, basically all you're left with is you've got a dead wizard at your feet and you're just staring up at the blood red skies as you know, the moon turns black and starts to get pulled down towards you. I guess that's a way to go. It's an interesting image. Um, but that's how the apocalypse stone ended. Uh, like I said, crazy Mike's, Crazy Mike did not get the uh, the poetic, you know, final image of them staring up at the at the sky they've caused to fall. Uh, no, they got they met their end at, at the belly of a giant slore. Um, uh, many people in the Forgotten Realms knew what it was like to roast in the belly of a slore that day. I can tell you, but um, it was a, it was a death with um, they went down swinging. And they got eaten by Godzilla. So you can't ask for much more of a glorious death than that. So it worked out. Uh, and strangely enough, the players were not upset by this. Uh, they were very, they were not very young, but they were young players. They were relatively new to this. And they thought the way they went down was pretty awesome. They were fighting an arch devil. They fought three pit fiends and they went down swinging against frigging Godzilla. It's not time wasted to them. And hey, wouldn't be time wasted to me either. Sounds like a hell of a way to go. And, um, well, this is the, uh, this is the nuclear option. But if you're part, if you're, uh, if your game's out of control and no one can help, and, uh, if you can find it, I, I would try the Apocalypse Stone. Maybe you'll get it to work. And hey, at least, at the very least, you'll have some really cool stories about how far they got. Um, I've seen some parties, not seen them, but I've heard some parties get right to the end. But in the end, everything burns. <laughs>